Hello and welcome to another series in our insect pest management videos. This series is going to focus on insecticides, labels, and modes of action. Uh, today we're going to focus primarily on labels and agricultural use chemicals. Right now I'm standing in our insecticide storage and fungicide storage room. A um, couple of things that I want to point out about pesticide storage. First, you want to avoid having as much stuff on the floor as we do in here. You want to make sure that your floors are clear so that you don't have any tripping hazards. Uh, you also want to store your products so that they're not exposed to excessive heat or cold. Uh, most labels will give you a range in temperatures between like 40 and 90 or 50 and 90 or so. And this room is environmentally controlled so it does not freeze and it does not get excessively hot in the summer. This room also has a vent fan that automatically comes on usually when the light switch is turned on but I've got it turned off for this video because it's very noisy. But that's really important for venting uh, volatiles. Uh, some of our products have really strong smells, especially the organophosphate insecticides. This room also has a recessed floor, so the, the hallway and the entranceway are higher than where I'm standing, and that's really important for spill prevention. We also have a flammable cabinet for our volatile uh, products. Another important thing to do with pesticides is to include a received date or purchased date on the bottle. I'm just going to pull a random product here off the shelf. This is a sample bottle uh, provided to us by industry. And you can see we've uh, got the name of the program that received it and the year. Products that get old may not perform as well. You may lose efficacy. Uh, the product may start to degrade in the container. So it's really important to use what you need in a year, not to purchase an excessive amount over that. And if you have very old products, to contact your state Department of Agriculture for disposal guidance. Some states will offer free uh, pesticide disposal. So contact your state Department of Ag. Alright, so let's get into insecticide considerations. Let's say we have a known insect pest affecting our crop, um, either from you looking at your crop or a paid crop consultant or in consultation with your local friendly extension person. What they will do, they'll, they'll point you to a couple of handy reference guides. I'm holding here one such guide. This is the Mid-Atlantic Commercial Vegetable Recommendation Guide uh, for our region. Uh, there's a few others. There's a few other regional university publications for organic crops, for greenhouses, for tree fruit, small fruit, and for field crops. Uh, so depending on your cropping system, there is university resources available uh, for you. Contact your local friendly extension person for that. So let's say we've got an insect pest on tomatoes and we have identified that that insect pest needs to be controlled and what that insect is. Let's say a uh, tomato fruit worm or cornea worm. Um, so we go to our guide. And we get to the tomato section. Pumpkins winter squash, spinach, strawberries, summer squash, sweet corn, sweet potatoes, ah, tomatoes. Not only does this guide have extremely important cultural information on how to uh, fertilize and irrigate the tomatoes, but also important nutrient considerations, how to graft, um, important cultural uh, factors, row spacing, staking, stringing, transplanting, uh, harvesting, shipping, and also disorders. But then we come to the pest control subsections. Uh, weed control, insect control, and disease management. 
So let's say we've got a worm, we've got a table. Let's say we've got a worm. We've got a table here for lepidopter and pests. And it includes quite a few products. In this guide, these products are arranged by their mode of action group number. That's how an insecticide works and will be the subject of the next video in this series. This does not necessarily mean that they are in order by what is necessarily recommended or the go-to product, just they're arranged by their mode of action group. So when I come to worms, I see we've got a whole bunch of labeled agricultural products. Uh, starting at the top, we've got Lanate going all the way down to uh, Minecto Pro. I'm going to pick on Minecto Pro for the purpose of this video. And what we have here is all of our pesticides are going to have a front label. And it's really important to read those labels anytime you are handling that product or getting ready to use that product. This guy just has some handy reference information on rates, re-entry intervals, pre-harvest intervals, and a bee toxicity rating. But this label has a lot more information that is critical for you to know. So it's always a good idea to read the label every time that that product is being applied. And also, it's important to know that the label is the law. Occasionally, your friendly entomology editor might get something wrong in the guidebook. So all error or labels change. So always consult the most up-to-date label. Now, each bottle is going to have a label. Uh, it's written in really small ant-sized font. It's hard to flip through, and these things honestly come off quite easily until you've got a jug that looks like this. So, one thing that's really uh, good to do is to use uh, a label aggregation site such as Kelly's or Agrian or CDMS to pull up those labels. So I'm going to go ahead and do that right now. Okay, so we had a computer glitch in our pesticide building, so we've come back here to the Extension Entomology Lab to pull up some labels. Um, so right here we've got CDMS's website, and before I get dive into looking for Minecto Pro's label on CDMS's site, I also wanted to point out that on various university land grant extension pages you will find these uh, guides for pest management. So here on UD's uh, website, we've got our commercial vegetable recommendation guide, which can be downloaded in, in whole or in part. We also have in various locations on our website, uh, crop guides for field crops. So this is insect management and soybeans. And another really handy guide is the My IPM app. Uh, this has been developed for a lot of fruit crops and diseases and field crops and insects and is being further expanded upon. So this is a really cool mobile app for use on smartphones. It includes not just what products are labeled but also an overview of the insect or the disease, uh, characteristics about them, and other management uh, advice. So check that all right, because some of the funny buzzing sound, I've recorded this section separately. So now we're going to go through Minecto Pro's label. And I'm picking on Minecto Pro not as an endorsement of the product, but because there is some important information on its label that I really want to point out. So here we are on CDMS. I'm going to go to Product Database. I'm going to click on that. And I'll search for Minecto Pro. Minecto Pro and pull up the label. CDMS also includes supplemental labels and two double E labels as well. And that those those two label types are really important because they won't show up necessarily on the label that's on the jug. Uh, they're updates. Uh, so do check out the label aggregation uh, services. All right, so we've got Minecto Pro's label up right now. In the vegetable guide, 
products that are restricted use are going to be indicated with an asterisk. On the label, there's going to be a big restricted use box. This will say why it's restricted use due to toxicity of fish, mammals, aquatic organisms. And also what this means is that somebody that has a restricted use applicators license is the only person that's allowed to purchase and handle and mix and apply the product. Or if somebody who does not have a license, depending on your state, is handling and, and applying, then a licensed applicator has to be in direct supervision of that person. All right, so now we've got um, uh, the active ingredients, cyanotranilopril and abamectin. Uh, it'll tell you how much is in a gallon, 1.13 pounds and 0 0.24 pounds per gallon. There's some percentages. And it'll give you the mode of action group number. So this is a group 6 insecticide and a group 28 insecticide, combining a good miticide with a good worm product. Another really important piece of information on these labels is the signal word. You're either going to see caution, warning, danger, or danger skull and crossbones for especially hazardous materials that are very, very toxic. Um, so this gives you a, a clue of, of the potential concern uh, that you may have with uh, this product. All right, and then we're going to go into some of the front matter. Uh, first, we've got first aid, what to do if you've come into uh, contact with the product or if you are um, with somebody who has come into contact with the product. Um, physician notes. Um, some products say to start uh, induced vomiting and, and others say do not induce vomiting. We've got precautionary statements, uh, hazards to humans and domestic animals. This is really, really important, personal protective equipment. This is kind of a minimum of what you should wear when handling the product at all times. Um, long sleeve shirt, long pants, shoes, socks, gloves, eyeglasses, eyewear protection, um, might not necessarily be on the label, but you don't want to get anything splashing in eyes. Then some other, um, you know, user safety recommendations, you know, wash your hands before eating, drinking, using the bathroom, that sort of thing. Uh, environmental hazards, uh, how to avoid um, causing undue potential damage to the environment, uh, re preventing runoff. Ah, here's a, here's something that's, um, fairly unique to uh, certain insecticide labels. Uh, products that are especially hazardous to bees, you may see these bee hazard icons on them. So a lot of the neonicotinoid insecticides have them. Abamectin is a very toxic uh, product to honeybees. So it's got these boxes on its label. Um, and so pay attention to this. This has some very specific instructions on how to apply this product to avoid um, you know, potential bee kills. So I'm going to uh, scooch on down here. Here we go. Here's those bee icons again. For crops under contracted pollination services, uh, do not apply while bees are foraging. So wait until dusk. Um, if an application must be made when bees are in the treatment site, the beekeeper providing those services must be notified no less than 48 hours prior so that the bees can be removed, covered, or otherwise protected. Now, how do you know who the beekeeper is or who the nearby beekeepers are in the case of, of this section right here, uh, where beekeepers are notified no less than 48 hours? Um, check out the website uh, FieldWatch. That uh, website, and, and then also uh, Bee Check. Um, because those websites will, um, if a beekeeper has registered hives on there, they will show up with that person's contact information. 
Then we've got the agricultural use requirements box. And this is a very important box because it's got one piece of critical information and that is the re-entry interval. This means that if you apply this product at eight o'clock PM, you cannot send anyone into that treated area until at least eight o'clock AM the next day. So you gotta have 12 hours. Otherwise, if that if a person is going into a treated area before that REI has expired, this is what they need to wear to protect themselves. All right, now we've got some product information. This is how the product actually works. Um, and this is really good information to have. So um, right here, uh, it has some contact activity, but is most effective through ingestion of plant treated plant material. Uh, affected insects and mites will rapidly stop feeding, become paralyzed, but this product takes a couple of days to kill an insect. This can sometimes cause uh, consternation with people that are checking for product efficacy shortly after an application. You know, used to some of our, say, oldie goodie insecticides that killed things dead quickly. Now, just because you see a live insect still on the plant doesn't necessarily mean it's doing any more damage. Doesn't mean that product has failed. It's just slower to actually kill them. Then we've got a, a box here on pest suppression. This will show up a little bit lower down. I'm going to circle back to pest suppression. Uh, and then uh, we've got information on you know, avoiding potential resistance in your target population. Then we have application directions. Uh, what kind of equipment and volumes and mixing. And to be honest, most of this is, is pretty boilerplate language, but there are still some important pieces of information to know. So pay attention to this, even though it, it may seem repetitive from label to label to label to label. Uh, for instance, if the pH of the spray tank after all products have been added and mixed is above eight, adjust that pH down. Um, uh, there's other language like uh, don't leave the product in a tank overnight, uh, don't tank mix with copper or, or some other products. Um, let's see here, crop safety. Some of the following materials when applied individually, sequentially in tank mixtures may solubilize the plant cuticle of uh, facilitating penetration into plant tissues and increasing potential for crop injury. How to know if tank mix partners are physically incompatible? Uh, it's got instructions on how to do a jar test and the mixing order of different formulations. All right, now this is something I wanna point out uh, about abamectin especially. Um, abamectin containing products often, if not always, have some language like this. To avoid illegal crop residues, must always be mixed with a non-phyto, non-ionic activator type wetting, spreading, or penetrating adjuvant or horticultural oil. And then pay attention to section seven for each crop. Scrolling down, there's a couple of adjuvant types that I didn't just mention. Do not use binder or sticker type adjuvants because these may reduce the translaminar movement of the active ingredient into the plant and can result in reduced efficacy. So on the one hand, you need certain adjuvants to make that product safe and effective. But on the other hand, other adjuvants, if they're used, might end up shooting yourself in the foot. Then we come to language on how to uh, apply that through a, an irrigation system like the drip lines or overhead irrigation and to do that safely and effectively and with specific um, equipment in place and in the right place. Uh, then we've got uh, rotational crop restrictions. Uh, generally insecticides, these are fairly short but on herbicides, these can sometimes be extremely long. So pay attention to this. 
and then we've got uh, some other use restrictions and spray drift management. This is especially important to pay attention to. Um, you know, there might be some state restrictions like do not apply with aircraft in New York state. Uh, on some labels, uh, this is where certain specific stipulations against using in greenhouses or other uh, protected ag or enclosed environment uh, settings will be placed. Other labels won't mention anything about greenhouses. So those are what we call silent labels. Contact your state department of ag for guidance on how your state interprets silent labels. And then we come to the crop use directions. And to be perfectly honest, uh, and it's a bit unfortunate, but this is where most people go to first and only, um, me included, honestly. Uh, but if you do that, then you miss out on some of that critical key information in earlier sections of the label, uh, which can be have a huge impact on product efficacy, on handler safety, on environmental safety, and um, it's just getting getting your money's worth out of that jug. All right, so let's come down to the fruiting vegetables, which have tomatoes. Here we've got our target pests and the rate ranges that are supported by the label. Uh, and then we've got some, some pests down here for suppression. So if you've got a very low population, this is secondary, but you're really trying to target uh, armyworm or mites or um, tomato fruit worm, aka corned earworm, soybean podworm, sorghum headworm, uh, then, then you may knock some of the thrips back, but this is not a product that Extension is going to recommend for thrips specifically. Also contact your local friendly Extension agent in case there are pests that have developed resistance, but are still on the label. For instance, uh, tomato fruit worm will show up on a lot of pyrethroid labels, but they pyrethroid efficacy is, is very inconsistent with this insect. All right, so then we've got um, uh, some other uh, important information such as minimum water volumes. Now for tomatoes, this is like the absolute bottom floor minimum. I want to see water volumes approaching, you know, 100 gallons or more. Um, you know, certainly higher than 20. And then we've got use restrictions here. Uh, again, this here is the adjuvant requirement showing up again with a reminder not to use binder or sticker type adjuvants. Your maximum single application rate, maximum season application rate, and minimum reapplication interval if you are making two shots of Minecto Pro on a crop in a season. And then uh, let's see here, another um, uh, tomato specific restriction not for use in commercially grown greenhouse tomatoes in New York. And then finally, the pre harvest interval. And this is critical. This is the number of days that have to pass before that crop can be harvested. Um, so when we've got multiple pests moving through the system, we've got to select products that will that are labeled for them, but also with a short enough pre-harvest interval that we can get back in and, and harvest when we need to, or else we may have bigger problems on our hands. So I hope that helps provide important uh, understanding and appreciation for all of the information that is on insecticide labels. Stay tuned for the next part in the series where we will go over mode of action groups and what those mean, what their typical characteristics are, uh, and other considerations when using and selecting insecticides. Thank you very much.